Well, hello, everybody. Great meeting you all here, and great being here with Ida, who's today all the way from Berlin. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about femtech. But first of all, this term uh, that's so interesting and kind of new, um, I, I wanted to know why is it important to have coined this term and that this actually is existing, not only because of what came after, but what does femtech actually mean and why is it important to have this term in the world that you introduced? So I wanted to create a term for what I saw a group of startups, early stage startups were building around 2013. And I was trying to figure out, like, how do we think about ourselves? And I could see that the language was a little bit all over the place. And I figured if we had a term, we could easily find each other. It would be easier for, in bracket, male investors to say, I have invested into a femtech company, rather than saying uh, I invested into this period tracking app or something else that might feel a little bit awkward to say. Um, and I think what it has done is that it has helped people understand for themselves that we are part of a really big global movement that are changing culture and building technology. And that is empowering. Absolutely. Well, you know, in psychology, there's this bias called that. I already knew that. And when, when we say that things happen because of that, and people are like, yeah, well, that makes sense. But until you don't address it, you can't work on it, right? So that's why it's a great thing that we are have now this femtech. Talking about this, well, I come from the healthcare world as well, and, and I've seen over the years how important it is to address problems and in, in a general way. So we've seen that research over the past years uh, was more male-focused and that affected and treatments and other things. What do you see um, Fempetech as an opportunity regarding the healthcare world and how treatments, machinery and technology is mm -hmm. adopted? I mean, it's very clear that Femtech is needed because there's been a huge innovation gap and a huge funding gap um, when it comes to things related to female health. And I should say female health is not only reproductive health, that's where I started my journey, but Femtech is also about things like bone health, or brain health, mental health. So basically places where women express symptoms differently or disproportionately could also be cardiovascular health. Um, so when we have more attention and we become more aware, we start seeing that there are so many things that were not addressed appropriately or sufficiently. We don't have data on women's bodies that are, you know, we don't have enough of it. We don't have medication that was tested on women until about 30 years ago. There are so many areas where we just simply kind of overlook that it is a unique and different experience to have a woman's body. Um, both on a physiological level, but definitely also emotionally and socially. And I think so much of women's experiences, like of life experiences of what it is to live in this biology has been invisible in culture. And what's amazing with kind of culture expanding is that when we start seeing something that was hidden in the shadows before, we start seeing, oh, there's all these needs that needs being addressed. And then women are, you know, tired of waiting. They're like, go on, I'll, you know, I'll build this technology. And I think that's what we're seeing now, driven by this need that really has been ignored for a very long time. Absolutely. Well, I am one of them, so I can totally relate. Um, we at NEX, we manage medical appointments. We manage around more than six million people per month, right? And apart from the fact of the difference we see in the medical appointments, so of course, uh, we don't have many male patients going to a uh, gynecologist, um, there's, there's a different patrons in what kind of specialties women and men go to. There's obviously general stuff. But what we see is there's a very big difference in communication, especially miscommunication regarding treatments or needs. Now, this is starting to be addressed. So, for example, we're having a lot of talks about menopause or perimenopause, which is a very recent term as well. What do you think this femtech a world could have as opportunities, not only in the treatment or the addressing or the research, but also in the way we actually get the message sent to, to other women that might not be as knowledgeable. You know, Clue did a research project recently where they were asking kind of, you know, 
What are your experiences having this biology? And the stories we heard were really horrific. People would be like, yeah, I'm lying in like fetus position two days a month, and I really would like to know how to manage this better. And we're like, no, 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 like, nobody should be lying in fetal position every month. You know, there's a lot of um, kind of unawareness in women ourselves about what is normal, what is healthy, you know, how can I actually have, kind of achieve well-being. So I think technology is amazing because it educates and it helps us understand that, um, you know, what is within a norm and what is outside a norm. And that, in bracket, I should say, also means that we as technology builders have a huge responsibility in figuring out how do we communicate what a norm is. There's a lot of, of course, gender questions in that when you work in female health, and it's definitely an area where um, we are battling a lot of very outdated norms. Talking about the norms, there's also been a change in behavior. We've seen this change over the past many years, of course. More women getting into the workplace, having more um, demanding jobs that are probably more stressful. Uh, just recently, I got the data from last year, um, born rate versus abortion rate in Spain. And the fact is that there are over 100,000 abortions, while less than 100,000 um, births. So this is clearly a, a change in behavior, and it's just an example of how women are taking decisions and their behavior is different as maybe some years before. How do you see this is, has to be addressed, and how can you know, having this femtech focus help in this sense? Hmm. I mean, I'm very technology sort of optimistic. I think it has a huge potential financially and socially. I think it's a huge important driver for actually moving towards a healthy planet. But I also see that sometimes technology wants to fix women's bodies. You know, if we are, and people are already building this or trying to build this to delay menopause or to build babies in labs. And we're like, no, no, we, you know, the woman's body is amazing. It's a miracle, like we can create humans. We don't need labs for that, but we need more space in our culture so that we can, you know, live in tune with our bodies. And I think that's, you know, when we have more abortions and births, we have to ask ourselves a question, like, you know, what's going on? Why is it so unattractive to give birth? Not that I necessarily think we need that many more people on the planet. That's a whole other controversial question. Like, why are we always so concerned about falling birth rates? There's an economic problem with that, I get that. But still, and I think, you know, it's a moment where, as we shed more light in these areas of culture where we really didn't look for a very long time, it raised a lot of questions of, like, you know, what is a good life in this female body? Must we really freeze our eggs and be fertile till we're 60? Or should we rather create a world where, you know, it's more attractive to be more in tune with our biology? I think those are really important questions. And I don't think we have the answers. I think that's an ongoing conversation, but I think it's really important that we don't have technology lead. We must first ask what planet do we want to have, and then we build technology to fit that world and not the other way around. Well, we're, we've been focusing a lot on, on the health part, but obviously femtech doesn't only address us as a gender, right? It addresses as a, a vision, needs, wishes. Um, so how do you see your involvement within this femtech, which was initially maybe uh, focused more on the tracking of our bodies? Do you think there's, there's a way more than that, away from our bodies? And how do you envision it? I think there's a way deeper into our bodies. I think there is a r lot of really interesting innovation happening where we start using, for instance, menstrual blood as a place to look for biomarkers or doing breast cancer detection, urine. So really deep tech um, that can help us move potentially towards more preventive care. I think, um, you know, technology is this beautiful place where we can enhance our lives, and I think this whole question of what, you know, what do we call success when we build technology companies? Is it only profit, or do we actually have something else that we want to achieve? And I think I want to raise this as an important sort of across technology sectors question. I think we have had a really narrow view of what success is, which is money, but I feel that we've, you know, we're on a planetary track where we can't really afford ourselves to say we are successful if we only make money. We have to actually create a, a healthy planet. And, um, and health is a good place to start because my kind of 
base assumption is that until women feel well in their bodies, it's really hard to have a voice in the world. And I think the world needs urgently to have many voices be part of shaping our world. So for me, that's how they connect. Well, I mean, I sometimes envision us women that, uh, you know, try to juggle everything. And now it's not only us women, there's a lot of uh, men as well dealing with, with all these different uh, sides of, of life. And I envision it as a little bit as an emergency room, right, where you don't know what's going to come. Um, talking about that, um, only last year, emergency room visits only in Spain have increased 30%. So there's a point up into up to what point can the system actually support this, right? So we're seeing it uh, with primary care that is inexistent and that emergency rooms are growing. Us as people, up to what point do you think we're going to be able to juggle all these variables in our life? Not, mer not very long more. I think there's a huge stress in the system on an individual level. There's never been worse sort of mental health you know, situation than there is. We see it in fertility. There's a huge fertility crisis, a planetary crisis. I mean, so I think we have to slow down in a massive wave, individually and sort of collectively. And we can do things like the four-week, uh, four-day work week, or many other things that really can help people actually have more healthy lives. I think this whole question of how do we build for health is a really key question I would like all technology builders to ask themselves. How do we build for health in our own lives as leaders, in our organizations, and how does our product bring us towards a more healthy planet? And it's, I know these are really big questions. I know as a founder you are battling a billion things. This is really difficult. But I will say I think it's entirely possible. And at least my experience being a CEO for 10 years for Clue was that when you deeply care about health in an organization, you build resilience and you build goodwill and you build um, a kind of commitment and coherence in the organization that is worth money. Not just well-being and being competitive, but it's, it's actually a real asset you're building. And I do you think that we can do much more to train leaders to really know how do you build this kind of deep commitment, resilience, coherence in organizations? And health is a big part of doing that, I believe. Talking about longevity and, and you know, what you were saying, trying to go and, and survive um, as much as possible. Uh, there's this interesting study that actually was looking at why women always have a couple of years more life expectancy per country. You know, it's always like if men are 88, then women last 90. Or it's always a couple of years. So what they found out is that there was a very there was a variable that was probably very much um, helping this, which was that women used to have generally have communities of friends where they share stuff. So even if we now have maybe the same stress uh, or more, um, we can manage it better because we're sharing it with others. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, we should maybe also be worried not only about femtech, but now about male tech, because we have found ways to deal with this. And as you were saying, some ways are not only just body-wise, but you know, how you behave. Do you think there's opportunity for male tech to exist? Oh, it already exists. We call it tech. <laughs> um, yes, I, I mean, there are definitely parts of the male body that need special attention. But the thing is, we have already, you know, cared quite a lot about, you know, building little blue pills that can help in specific situations um, and other things. So the, the, the few things that are really specific to male health, believe me, there has been a lot of attention on them. And that's great. <laughs> so, yes, but the, the thing is, it's not, a, it's not like a fairness question, oh, we have femtech, so we should also... It's like, the fact is, we come with a specific type of biology that comes with a lot of maintenance. We have all kinds of issues happening all the time. I have never met a woman who doesn't have a story to tell. There's always been this happening and that happening, and, you know, and it costs money, and it takes attention, and it takes technology to address them. And the fact is just that males have a different biology that doesn't come with quite the same amount of trouble <laughs> and possibilities. So it's, I think that's just a fact. And we don't have to put a judgment, like a value judgment on that. It's just, it's a huge opportunity. And because of the way our culture has been built, we have just ignored a huge need and a huge business opportunity. And it's, you know, Femtech is said to be a trillion dollar industry within a couple of years. 
I think it might be more. Like, because when you really look at it, if you take something like, when is a woman menstruating? That's a data set I have, a huge data set, one of the biggest in the world on that. If you really took that data set seriously and you overlaid it on how do we build cars, how do we organize our times, how do we do all kinds of things, you would probably come out with solutions that were really clever and actually would enhance productivity or you come up with new business ideas. It's a really central data set. And so I think the more awareness we have on female health and the reality it is to have this body, the more we can build a world that is actually fitting women, and that's a huge economic sort of, um, well, potential. Like, it's a button you can press. I mean, there's a huge underinvestment in women and women's bodies. Just to finish, um, there's a lot of talk about, um, as you were saying, technology being male dominated, not only because there was more CEOs, male CEOs, and it was already focused and research, but also because there's less and less um, developers that are female. Do you think, do, are you in the opinion that this affects the final product if, if there's no female in the equation? Yes, yeah, sometimes people say built by women for women. I'd like to invite everybody to think about building for the world by diverse teams. We need men to build in femtech. We need them as investors, as a, you know, team leaders, co-founders, journalists, lawyers, as people cheering us on. We need men to participate in this. Femtech is for society. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. And it was great meeting you, Ida. Thank you so thank much. You. Bye.